What's up, Dob fam? I'm gonna tell you the biggest mistakes that I see cyclists making in the gym, and more specifically, with their strength training, all in hopes that you don't do the same. Now, I want you to know that I have personally had to learn the hard way on everything I'm about to bring up, and after working with more and more cyclists over the years, I've realized that I'm not the only one. And although most of us deal with the same issues regarding strength training and cycling, I understand that there's nuance to our lives, our training situations. You know, we're, we're all special snowflakes, okay? So I'm not gonna put these in any particular order because one might be more relevant to you than it is to me and vice versa. So without further ado, let's start with the topic that's most on the forefront of my mind, and that is cyclists going into the gym and absolutely destroying their legs. Now, I'm not telling you to train easier. We just need a different approach to your training, which I'm going to give to you in a second. But let's talk about how cyclists end up training too hard to begin with. Essentially, it's in your nature. This is at least my experience. You love the feeling of hammering your legs on the bike. You have this sadistic uh, enjoyment of pain. You have this relationship with it where it is satisfying to you. And you know that walking in the gym and leaving with your legs barely just wobbling, looking at a small staircase, wondering if you can get down it or not, that's a great feeling. <laughs> I've definitely had that multiple times. And so you go into the gym seeking it. You have a full leg day that maybe you got from a bodybuilding routine. Maybe you have a weightlifting routine. And you walk in and think, okay, today's the day I'm going to do deadlifts. I'm going to do back squat. I'm going to do Bulgarian split squat and single leg Romanian deadlifts and hamstring curls and plyo box jumps and all these accessory movements because I want my legs to be stronger. This is what I should do, right? This is the obvious thing. Destroy my legs. Legs get stronger. But the problem is, when are you going to recover? This is the reality that a lot of weightlifters, bodybuilders, crossfitters, again, I love all these things. I'm not bagging on them, but they do not understand the toll of the volume of a typical cyclist. You know, a lot of these people who give recommendations for crazy high volume strength workouts like this, they don't go out and do multiple hours on the bike the next day or even that same day. In fact, a lot of these people will walk on a treadmill for 30 minutes and consider that their slow and steady cardio, their, their LSD, long, slow distance. And we all know that's a joke. But then you get people arguing like, okay, you're training different fiber types and you're training different energy systems. But I, I got news for you guys. It's still your legs and it's still your energy. And there isn't an infinite source of that. I mean, it, it just comes down to your individual recovery. But what a lot of cyclists end up doing is either skipping a ride the next day or they have crazy DOMS, which is delayed onset muscle soreness that lasts up to 72 hours. And they feel so stiff that even by the time they get to an interval session on the bike, it just doesn't feel quality. It's way more uncomfortable than it needs to be. And, and that's really what we want to avoid because if you're in the habit of strength training your legs one day per week, you are going to be forever sore. And you're not going to make that much progress considering how much pain you're going through to get there. So if you want to avoid this and make actual progress without that insane amount of pain and <laughs> discomfort, I mean, there's always going to be some pain and discomfort. There's always going to be the random day you're sore. There's going to be days you have to show up when you don't want to. But the trick is doing two sessions per week that are not just dedicated to legs. You should be training your total body at a minimum of two days per week. And when you go in with the mindset of, okay, I'm going to have one movement that is focused on my legs and then maybe one total body movement that also uses my legs, by the time you include a quality warm-up beforehand, you've trained your legs sufficiently. And if you have two sessions spread out over the week, you can do a variety of movements to make sure you hit a hip dominant movement and a knee dominant movement, maybe a bilateral, maybe a unilateral. So you have enough variety and now you have the consistency because you improved the frequency, more sessions per week. So don't get stuck in the forever sore cycle of hammering your legs one day per week. Now this next point kind of piggybacks what I just talked about, so we can go over it quickly. I'm just gonna reinforce the point that you need to be doing total body movements, not just total body sessions. You should have a movement in your workout that makes your whole body work at once. And a lot of times these end up being core movements or movements that require you to brace your core while other parts of your body are moving. And the reason doing these regularly is so important is because of power transfer. You know, when you sprint on your bike, even on the road bike, you can't tell me that you're only using your legs. Any high quality sprinter will know you are ripping on your bars, you're having to stabilize your trunk, and you're throwing power down through your legs. So you have power transfer going back and forth, back and forth from all your contact points. Your hands on the handlebars and your feet on the pedals. So keep that in mind. You're not just using your legs, it requires total body control. And if you train that, in a controlled environment, which is the gym for, for the most part, it's a little safer, you can focus on what you're doing, you can focus on your engagement, you're going to make that 
mind muscle connection that you need to do it autonomously. That, that's our goal. We train it in a controlled environment so that it becomes a habit and we don't have to think about it. And then we just explode on the bike and we're more efficient. This next tip is relevant to most of us, but it's specifically targeted for beginners. You guys, hear me loud and clear. If I could grab your face through this camera right now, I'd grab your ears like this, like Gordon Ramsay, and I'd say, What are you? An idiot sandwich. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I would grab your ears and I would say, Don't go too heavy too soon. Do not lift the failure in the first six months of consistent strength training. There is no need. There is literally no need. The risk far outweighs the benefits. And by failure, I'm talking about doing an exercise to a point where your form breaks down and you barely complete it or you actually do fail the movement. That could be picking up a barbell on a deadlift and having to drop it. That could be trying to press overhead and getting halfway and literally collapsing. It could be doing a bench press and getting stuck on the bench, flailing around, screaming for help because you can't get the bar up. Those are all ways to go to failure and it's completely unnecessary when you don't have a base of strength. Now, when you are more experienced in the gym, there's a point where progressive overload does become more and more important. And, and truthfully, with beginners, you're doing it from the beginning, but the whole idea is that you continue to increase the volume, the intensity, something to continue your progress. But the thing is, you just strength training consistently is your progressive overload. The intensity doesn't have to be very high for you to get results, and they call this beginner gains. This is when you can get bigger, faster, stronger, leaner, all at once, because it's such a new stimulus to your body, and your body's just trying to adapt to it. And of course, over time, your body does adapt, and the gains get more and more marginal. You have to be more specific about it, and you have to do the intensity, which requires almost failure at times, but not in the first, give me six months at least, maybe 12 months, but I don't want you missing two strength training sessions per week for more than a couple weeks throughout the year. I mean, this should be from sickness. This should be from some crazy circumstance. If you have multiple months off, you're not consistent yet. Sorry, I got a little fired up there. I didn't really give you tangible, actionable advice. My recommendation would be to, for one, never try and even entertain the idea of going to true failure. So go to a technical max, which means you go to the point where you can no longer maintain perfect form. You should strive for perfect form, and if you can't maintain that, that's when it's too heavy. Technical max. Also, when you're working up you know, toward that six to 12 months consistency to the point where you're maybe not considered a beginner, I would strive to have an RPE rate of perceived exertion of, of eight, no more than eight. So for instance, if you're doing a overhead press and you have eight reps to go for, your weight that you should do should allow for maybe 10 reps if you really needed to squeak it out. Two more than that, and you're probably going too light, you're not getting the training effect that you want. Uh, so you always wanna follow your rep scheme, but keep that in mind. It's like, you should always be a few reps from failure, and if I had to ask you how tough, tough it was, in your head it should be like kind of an eight out of 10. You know, gun to your head, you could definitely do more reps, uh, but also you're still getting enough strain to make impact. Another mistake I see cyclists making in the gym is not doing specific prep work for a movement that they're doing later on in the workout. For instance, if you have a deadlift to do, it's probably a good idea to get your glutes and your hamstrings firing before you start picking up a heavy barbell. And so if you are just doing a general warm up, maybe steady state cardio, that's totally okay. But before you go into that deadlift, I would recommend doing some type of glute activation or hamstring activation. This could be body weight glute bridges on the ground. This could be just doing some very light deadlifts or some butt taps against a wall uh, before you get into actually picking up a heavier load. Now, one thing I like to do in particular is really warm up my rotator cuff when I have heavier upper body work. So I'll do something specific for my rotator cuff in my shoulder to make sure everything is as stable and activated as possible. And it just makes me that much safer when I go into heavier movements or even movements that are just more complex, maybe less stable than a traditional movement. Maybe you're doing something with more power. Uh, that will allow you to do it more confidently and, and just safer. But I'll warn you not to get too carried away with this, and I have been so guilty of it in the past, where you start learning more about foam rolling and activation and dynamic mobility and instability. Like You learn all these little things, and you try and do all of them all the time, and pretty soon you have a warm-up that's 30 minutes long. I kid you not, I've been this guy. 
and it's so over the top, it feels very daunting every time you start a workout. You, you really don't want that. So you gotta pick a few. You know, most of my workouts online, they have an activation for your core, your shoulders, and your hips because typically those will cover the majority of what you do. And so it can be efficient. Don't get carried away and try everything all the time at once. It is like, it's just too much. There's too much to do. And the final mistake we're gonna cover, at least in this video, is letting the noise get to you and not committing to your program and seeing it through. This is so common in cycling, whether it's with your strength training program or whether it's with your on the bike program, there are constantly people telling you what is optimal, what is not optimal, what is based in science, what is bro science, and it, it, it never ends. It never ends. Trust me, as someone who talks to thousands of people online about strength training and cycling, I have heard it all. You'll do sweet spot training and people will tell you you're an idiot for not doing polarized training. You'll do polarized training and people will tell you you're an idiot for not doing high tempo work. You'll go to the gym and you'll do deadlifts and people will tell you you're an idiot for using a barbell instead of a trap bar. And the list just goes on and on and on. And the thing is that people get so focused on learning the science behind what is optimal that they never really end up putting in the work to get the results. This is the paralysis by analysis. You start over analyzing everything and pretty soon you start second guessing everything that you're doing even though the truth is the majority of paths you can take will probably give you progress and it's good to experiment with them to see what works best for you but not everything works for everyone. <laughs> Whether you get there this way, whether you get there that way, it doesn't really matter that much. And so I need you guys to cut out the noise, to focus and commit to whatever plan it is that you're trying to execute. So I'm asking you guys, don't allow yourself to be over-informed and under-transformed. Okay, I'm gonna say that one more time. Don't let yourself be over-informed and under-transformed. If you cannot take actionable steps with the information that you're learning, just remember, it could be somewhat of a waste of time or put it on a list for the future date or say, hey, you know, if I get to this date and I don't have these goals accomplished, I'm gonna then make these tweaks, but you gotta commit to it. Did I make that clear? You gotta commit to what you're doing. It's okay to make changes, but don't let people take you off your track. And I will tell you from experience, when you do start having success, when you do show that you're committed to something, it is going to make your peers uncomfortable. I've experienced this in the realest way. When you say, I'm doing this, and you start seeing it through, the closer you get to that goal, people are gonna start saying, eh, but you know, isn't this hard on your social life? Eh, you're not getting enough sleep as you should. Eh, but doesn't that stress your family out? Or eh, oh, it's hard to get up in the morning. Oh, you're gonna get burnt out. Oh, that's not sustainable. Ugh, I got a little carried away again, sorry. You know, I think I turned the camera on and it turns into like a venting session. Anyways. Thanks for listening. I hope those tips help you a ton. We'll go over them again real quick. Do not destroy your legs in one training day per week. Make sure, <laughs> make sure that you train multiple total body sessions per week. Also, make sure you're doing total body movements within those sessions. Make sure you're not going too heavy too soon. Give yourself a specific warm-up for whatever movements you're gonna be doing that day. And last but not least, stay committed to the process. If you guys enjoyed this video, if you found it valuable, please make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Drop this video a thumbs up and comment below if you have any questions, comments, you wanna tell me I'm an absolute idiot, do it below and I'll make sure I get back to you. <laughs> you guys like my acting on that one?